Usually we start a story at the beginning, but today we're going to start it at the end. Because unlike most stories, we're told in the book of Esther exactly what to do with this story. It comes in the festival of Purim, and that is a festival that comes every year, and in fact will be coming in March, March 4, when they're supposed to celebrate in a very specific way. They're supposed to collect money for the poor and give gifts to each other, eat lots of food, and read the text. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time looking at how the Jews will actually celebrate Purim. And I'm going to uh, give you all a role in this so you can help me. Because when the text was read, they uh, would often boo, hiss, and stomp their feet when the name of Haman was read. So just to understand a little bit of the background of this, the festival of Purim is like a Jewish Mardi Gras where the children all dress up in masks and costumes and there's a lot of eating and drinking to excess actually. And they're supposed to drink until they can't tell the difference between these two phrases, the curse of Haman and the blessing of Mordecai. So th this is a time of excess and, and lots of festival uh, and partying. Okay, so here we go. We need the, the hissers, the booers, and the stompers, all right? So over here to my left, you all will be the um, boos. You'll, you'll do the boos, okay? Can I hear it? Boo. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. Yes, all right, all right. And the center group, you will be the hissers, okay? Good, all right. And those of you over to the right, you will be the stompers. Good, all right. Um, I'm inviting the, the, the top uh, the, in the balcony to join us too. All right, let's do it all at once, shall we? Oh, that's good, all right. All right, now I'll read the text. It will not appear on the screen. You'll have to listen for the, the name of Haman. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. All right, here we go. Calling together his friends and Zeresh his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all. Haman added, I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet that she gave. All right, so the Feast of Purim. It's a festival that is actually not identified in the Torah, a festival that we don't keep today, but we remember still the story of Esther. But my question is why? Why? Why is it celebrated, one, in this manner? Because it's fairly excessive with all this eating and drinking and hissing and booing and stomping. Why is it celebrated that way? One reason is because the text is a text of excess. So let's just look at the numbers. It begins with a party that has lasted 180 days. That's nearly half a year. Can you imagine celebrating for half a year? Then it, then it goes to a man setting up gallows that are 75 feet high. That is the height of a six or seven story building. Okay, then, then we also have a man, Haman, who wants to experience and commit and send out an edict for genocide because he has a personal vendetta against a man who won't bow down to him. Now that's rage. And then we have at the end, interestingly enough, not genocide, but a reversal where, according to the text, the Jews were given permission to go against anyone who went against them, and they killed in two days 75,810 people. 75,810 people. Now, those are all big numbers, and we're not going to argue about whether all of that's possible or why those numbers are so big, but it is a big story. That's why the festival is so big. But when all the hissing, booing, the stomping dies down and the masks come off and the costumes are laid aside, we have to ask ourselves, why are we celebrating this story? 
Because in the end, the reality is this. They are still in exile. They could have and they should have gone home to Jerusalem. Because as we know, there's been a decree that has allowed them all to go back. And the ones that are still in Persia are the ones who have chosen not to go back home. Even after being encouraged by the prophets to return, why are these people still in Persia? Second, we have a book in which the name of God is not even used. Now we could say, well, it's not used because everybody understands that God is in and through everything. Or could it be that they have been in this land so long that they're now telling the story and they have forgotten to mention his name? Third, there's a lot of celebration going on in relation to this skirmish. What about the broader picture? What about the bigger understanding, the fact that they are not home, that they are still in a foreign land. So when all is said and done, we have to ask that question, why are we celebrating? Why is this story so important? For me and for many other young people, not just women, but women and men, the reason is this. In the inner chamber, there is a young woman waiting to go into the presence of a man, a king, that she knows, but not well enough. And she is about to lay her whole life on the line. And the question is, why? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we pray that you will be with us as we open this text. And we ask again about the many characters that have, have blessed our lives in the past. We pray that you will be with us now and that you will give us a special measure of your spirit. Give us a deeper understanding that we have had before than we have had before so that we might impact the world in a bigger way. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1989, I'll never forget a picture I saw on the news. It was a, a man, and there have been all kinds of ideas about how old he was, we don't really know. A man in black pants and a white shirt. And he had a bag in each hand, and he was standing down a whole line of tanks in Tiananmen Square. There was a, a people protest and for some reason, this man, who apparently had just been shopping, decided that he had to step out. And there he was, with a bag in each hand, standing in front of a whole line of tanks. He was not going to move. Because he believed that what they were about was wrong. And there he stood, with a bag in each hand, as all the people around him and on television couldn't believe what this one man was doing. And then as the tanks backed up to go around him, he simply moved over. It was like a dance, but it wasn't funny. And I remember wondering at the time, as I was quite young, I remember wondering why? Why would this man do that? It's obvious who could win that stand down. What would motivate a man to do that? Well, the answer to that question we'll never know because we've never found the man. He either slipped into the group of people or he was carted off. Some people think he was assassinated. Some people think that he simply slipped off and didn't want to be known. But we will never know what gave him the courage to do that. Why in that moment did he think he must, not even setting his bags down, go out and stand, have a standoff with those tanks? In our text, we have a story of that sort. We have a woman in an inner room waiting to go into an ancient palace and stand down the tank. She is putting her life on the line. And the question is, why? What would motivate someone to do something like that? Let's listen to the story. 
Chapter 4. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict or order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. They are upset because they are about to die. Not about. There will be about 11 months from this point, or 12 months. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. And then Esther summoned Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathach went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money that Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. So he's explaining why all this wailing is going on in the area there near the palace. Because Haman is upset that Mordecai didn't bow down to him. There is an old anger between the, the backgrounds of both of these men. Not because he wasn't being worshipped, because there was a vendetta between ancient traditions and ancient peoples. And Haman is upset. He's so upset, very good, he's so upset that he's ready to um, accomplish genocide. The Jews are mourning. They're wailing. In approximately 12 months, they will be annihilated. And Mordecai is sending this message to Esther. Okay, then he says the unusual thing. He says, and he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Okay, now, that is a very difficult request. In order to understand how she might understand this, let's go back just a little. What we know about Esther is that she is in exile. She is living in Persia. But why is she in Persia? She's a young girl. She's in Persia not because she chose to be in Persia. She's in Persia because those who were taking care of her decided not to go home. And you think, well, what kind of parents would make that decision? Oh, that's interesting. Because the text suggests that actually her parents are deceased. She has no parents at this point. And that whoever is taking care of her has made that decision for her. And then we find out that the person taking care of her is Mordecai. So it is Mordecai that is chosen to stay in Persia, and thus that is where Esther is. So she suffered the loss of her family, the decision made by others, and then she has suffered through the idea that the king has gathered all the virgins together so that they can be picked among for his queen. Now, you might say, well, that's an honor, but that's not the word that comes to my mind. The word that comes to my mind is trauma. Why? Because she has no mama to navigate this with her, to help her understand what this means and how to be. She is a young girl on her own, out there just trying to figure out how to survive. Mordecai tries to help because he goes to her and he says, now, take my advice. Don't let them know about your background. If you, if you want to survive, don't let them know who you are. So here's a young girl that's supposed to keep a secret about who she is in a foreign land, in exile, in a place, and being a queen that she doesn't know how to be. And she is just trying to survive. In every woman's life, 
there comes a point at which she must move from being and acting and thinking like a child to being, acting, and thinking like a woman, like a grown woman. But Esther is not here yet. That crown is placed on her head, but she is not yet a queen. And all of a sudden, she gets news like this. We're all going to die. And then comes the main point. Go into the king's presence and beg for mercy. Plead with him for our people. Up until now, Esther has done what others have told her to do. Keep this secret about your background. And then there is a tender moment where Haggai comes and he gives her special food and he helps advise her what to take with her in her one night with the king. So she's been doing and trying and being what people have told her to do and try and be. And the text even says that when she comes into the court around all these people, that she wins the favor of all those around her. Well, of course. Because this is a woman, who's a young girl who's experienced a lot of pain, a lot of being pushed around, a lot of trying to figure out how to be. And this is the kind of person that loves deeply if she isn't crushed by it all. Of course she's won the favor of those around her. She is a nice girl. But now she's being hit with heavy issues. Go into the presence, beg for mercy from the king, plead with him for our people. Suddenly, Esther begins to grow up. She sends back this message. All the king's officials and the people in all the royal provinces, not just me, all these people know, and Mordecai, you know, that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, not two, not three, one, that he be put to death. And the only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 13 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Don't ask me to do this because you are asking me to die. Oh, Esther's growing up. Suddenly, suddenly we hear not the, story, not the sound of a girl's voice. We hear the sound of a woman. I've done, I've told, I've been what I've been told to be and do and say. But this is too much. But her mentor has been at it longer and knows what to say. Do not think, he says, that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. And you and those of your father's family, your father who died already, now that hurt, you and they will die. Now that feels like a threat to me. But I understand it. I understand why a mentor would get anxious because genocide is looming on the horizon. And he wants to push this mentee of his further, harder. Come on, Esther. This is the time. You are the one. You've got to do this because we need it. And if you don't, well, his help is going to come from somewhere else. Where is that other place? He doesn't say. Who is that other person? He doesn't say. But from somewhere else, it's a threat. Come on. And if you don't do it, you're going to die anyway. Threats are interesting. Threats are interesting because they do have a certain power. I remember the threat of a friend who wanted to spiff my wardrobe up a little bit and wanted me to try on some shoes with sequins. And I looked at those shoes with sequins as I put them on my foot, and I thought, there's no way I could ever wear these shoes. And then she said this, if you don't buy them, I'm going to. Now, you women know what I mean right there. Yeah, see? All of a sudden, they take on more value. 
All of a sudden, they seem like the things that you just have to have. Because if you don't buy them, she will. It doesn't matter that her feet are three sizes bigger than yours. It doesn't matter that she really couldn't wear them. It only matters that suddenly they're more valuable. It's like when you're in an auction, and I remember the first time I ever said I wanted to get some furniture for my house as a student. And I remember my hand going up and, and up, and, and it went up again, and I thought, wait a minute, I'm past the amount I want to pay, but oh dear, what happened just there? It's that threat. It's the threat that the person next to you sees the value and somehow you don't, and it seems more valuable. Now, the men can understand that one. So there's the threat. But what I have learned about threats is that they don't carry you for very long. You get that item home, and you say, what was I thinking So her mentor has issued a threat, a threat that has hurt her because he has appealed to her dead father and a possible dead family of her father's family, and it would all be her fault. That hurts. But that isn't all that Mordecai says. He says this. It's almost like he takes a deep breath, and he says, and who knows? Who knows, but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. It's, you can almost hear that sort of broken yearning, that admission. My dear child, I have come to the end of what I can do. I need help. I need you to grow up. I need you to grow up fast. Because you really are the only hope. I've talked about help from elsewhere, but I haven't identified where that could be. Grow up, child. Grow up fast. And you hear the yearning in that part of the message. And you realize that as Esther hears that part, something else probably happens. It always happens when a person is inspired. We all are so excited as we live in America because of the American Revolution, because they stood up a David and Goliath story to the British monarchy, but that's not where it really happened. It really happened in back rooms where they sat and talked about what they wouldn't do and who they wouldn't be and who they wouldn't serve. We think about Luther. We visit that statue at Worms where he's holding the Bible and he says, here I stand, I can do no other. But that's not where it happened. It happened in a little room at a little desk in dark lighting and a Bible and a man who's decided that you change the world by picking up a pen and writing. It happens where the idea happens. It happened for Rosa Parks, not where she sat in the front of the bus, but where she stood and said to herself, someone has to take the first step. Someone has to do it. And I'm going to do it. And when I do, I'm not going to move. Yeah. And it happened with Anne Frank as she sat in that little room in the midst of a war, an awful war, and says to herself, because we know she said it, because she wrote it, Someday, I want to be a writer, never knowing that at that very moment it was happening. The real act, the real place of heroism is not in the actual act, it's in the inspiration that comes before the act. It is in that decision of the man to say, is no one going to move? I'm going to go out there and stand in front of the tanks. I'm not even going to take time to put my bags down. They need me. This issue needs me now. This is where Esther grew up. This is where Esther went from wearing a crown to being a queen, going from a child to a woman to a queen. She says, go tell Mordecai, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though 
I know it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Boom. This is a courageous general. This is the wisdom of a sage. And she marches through this decision for the rest of the story. And you know the story. Where the man who built the gallows, supposedly six, seven <laughs> stories high, ends up hanging on it. And where of, of people that were going to be annihilated then kill others, 75,000 plus. She marches through as a queen because she is inspired. She does what she has to do because she has to do it. And guess what? Mordecai, the mentor, becomes the mentee. In verse 17, so Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. At the end of the story, we have to ask, why are we celebrating? Why are we celebrating? Because we are still in captivity. We are still here. We're still not speaking about God as much as we should. We're still celebrating all the little battles, the little successes that have been won and sometimes lose sight of the big one. The big one is we belong home. Where are those people who will take us there? Where are those people that will be inspired more than they are fearful of the threat? Where are those people that will just completely turn their eye and their ears away from, you're not good enough, you're not old enough, you're not the right gender, you're not in the right spot, and listen with intensity to those moments of, who knows? Who knows, but that you have come into this position for such a time as this. It is that voice, it is that inspiration that will carry us home. Amen.